Hi everyone, welcome to Media Mayhem. Today's guest is Tori Chrisman, former Scientologist and a very vocal critic of the Church of Scientology. She's here today and we're talking Scientology. Stay with us. everyone, welcome back to Media Mayhem. Today's guest is somebody that I really wanted to have on the show and that Mark Ebner urged me to have on the show because she is a former Scientologist and actually one of their biggest critics. And despite her very lovely and friendly appearance, she's done quite a bit to keep people from joining the, search of, the Church of Scientology. And I want to welcome Tori Crispin to the show. Thank you so much. Now, you guys can watch Tori on her YouTube channel. She speaks a lot about Scientology. But today, I'm going to ask you some questions and some things that maybe you haven't covered okay. completely. But just so that our viewers get up to speed and understand how you got into the church and then how you got out of the church. I know it's rather lengthy, but what prompted you to leave the church? And those are, that's just sort of where I wanted to start. All right. And I know you were in for 30 <laughs> years and your husband was in as well. Um, so what, what prompted you to join? I read the book Dianetics. I was in college and uh, some kids from high school brought me this book and I thought, I'd always, my grandfather was a doctor and I always wanted to kind of be a doctor, but I thought I'm never gonna make it through all those years of college. And I thought, perfect, I can be an auditor, which is their, defi their definition or name of a counselor. And so I had a fight with my dad. He said, it's our morals or no school. And so I pulled down my shade and I wrote in lipstick, your morals are no school, screw you. And it was 1969 and I hitchhiked from Chicago to Los Angeles. 69, everybody was hitchhiking, it was fine. I mean, my <laughs> brother was scared, but I was like, hey, I got it there. And I literally went up to American St. Hill and said, I wanna to speak to the guy on the big horse. And they said, you can't, you have to come back at 10.30. So I said, okay. So I went home and I mean, I went out to this other guy in the valley, I hitchhiked out there. We got stoned, and uh, <laughs> it was the 60s, hey? and uh, I didn't really think they'd call. I didn't, because we were hippies, you know what I mean? And hippies never follow up on what they're doing, or at least most of the people I hung with. I was in San Francisco as a hippie. Okay, I was, was wondering like, when this story was going to take yeah, you through San so, Francisco yeah, so it was 69. pretty crazy with all the you know, huge rock and roll stars, and it was a wonderful time. It was a really great time in my life. But that's what got me into doing drugs. Not in a big way, but you know, kind of like social drugs. So anyway, we went out in the valley, I got stoned, the guy showed up, he did call at 10.30, he called at 10.35. And, and I said, it's the guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, I'll be out in 20 minutes. And again, we don't think so, so we get stoned some more. And uh, <laughs> sure enough, he, he shows up 20 minutes later, drove me back to American St. Hill, which is Scientology. We sat outside, he went and got some beer, and I thought, well, can't be all bad, he drinks beer, because they look so robotic inside, right? And you have to remember, I was against organizations, against the Navy, because I was fighting against Vietnam, picketing for years, right? Not so much that ne never the military men or women, but the, the idea of the war, right? And so these guys are in Navy uniforms marching around, and I was against organizations, and they were super organized. So I was like, I don't, why am I here? You know what I mean? But this guy came out, got some beer, answered all my questions, because back then they had pictures of Hubbard all around, and I was like, this looks like Hitler. You know, it's very <laughs> weird. It was very weird for me. It really was. And uh, so he answered all the questions and then said, well, let's go meet the auditors. And they were so cool. And I just, I remember the second I turned off my critical thinking, and I thought, I don't care what these people do, I want to be one of them. Really, that, so are they dynamic or? Well, I mean, back then they were. Okay. They aren't so much now. They've very molded them into a whole different thing. But back then they were professors and smart people and hippies and just fun people, creative. It was a great time back then. It was okay, way so, different than now. So you join and when you join, what happens to the relationships for the people with people that aren't within the church? Well, of course, when you, once you get into Scientology, you're always trying to get all your friends and family into Scientology, too, because it's the way, right? And right away, Hubbard had these little things keeping Scientology working, and you, that's on every single course, and you have to follow these certain steps to get to total freedom, and you're on the bridge to total freedom. 
right? So right away, you start cutting off people that won't get in. It's so awful. Are you, if you can't convince somebody, is that considered that you're a failure in that regard, or? If you can't convince somebody to get in? Yes. Oh no, they're very, very slanted towards, the, that's why I call it the Truman Show. If you're in the show, and if you haven't seen the Truman Show, watch the Truman Show, but it's, it really shows how Scientology is. You know, come on in, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, you know, they're just so happy, so friendly. But if you're not, you're just a wog. That's what they call them. And, and the so you don't that. really focus on that? Yeah, okay. They're, they're nothing. They're, they're wogs. You know, they're, they're PTS, meaning they're connected to a suppressive person, <laughs> which this is my suppressive person thing. And, and we're uh, going to get to that in a second. I know, but they, you know, I they, do they, talk they have about all that. these labels for what those group, those people are that aren't getting into Scientology. And they have a number of different things that you could be out ethics, low responsibility, PTS, low tone. You know, they have all the, and they have all this lingo that, of course, no one else knows what you're talking about. So after a while, you're only talking in Scientologies. In each other, you know what you're talking about, but no one else does. So that also be, those become your friends because you can only communicate with a certain. You don't realize it, but that's true. Now, what made you? So you're in there. Your husband, you, did you meet your husband while you were there? You get married, and is it a Scientology ceremony? Oh, yeah. What is, one of my friends, James Cormetta, asked me to ask you if there are specific religious ceremonies in Scientology, like sort of, um, like you would go to a Sunday service. Are those, are those, there are that, those kinds of things in Scientology? Okay, now I'll tell you the truth, and I'll tell you they're bullshit. Okay, the truth is no, there are no religious services. They have what they call audit, everything that they have that's religious, they sell. And you can say, well, the Catholics, you have to donate. Donations are one thing. They call it a donation, but you cannot literally go on to the next level until you've paid it. And it's thousands of dollars. <clears throat> so the very fact that they have a nonprofit uh, status is ridiculous. And most ministers that you can talk to, except if they've gotten to them, which they work on all kinds of people trying to say, well, you better be with us or these critics could go against you. No, we're not going to go against other religions. No, that's completely false. Scientology does very abusive things to their members, including declaring people suppressive, which cuts off. I, my dear friend Lori cannot talk to her children. They will not talk to her. I mean, imagine that. My friend Ida died having not talked to her son in 30 years. You know what I mean? And she was like, I'm only speaking out because my kids won't talk to me. I mean, how tragic is that? And that's only one of the abuses. There's like six or seven major abuses they have. To they stop free speech. Yeah, and that, you said, is the part of the reason that you left. And I think this is something that we all find very confusing that somebody, and especially with like Leah Remini and people that have been in for a long time and you're one of those kinds of people that have stayed for 30 years and then suddenly they leave and we wonder what is it, and you can only I guess do it on an individual basis, but for you, what was it that made you say that's it, that's enough? Okay, well, first I forgot, remember that question, because I forgot I to finish the Sunday service. Go ahead. Thing. So tell they me the other part of the now, service. Yeah. In the 70s, we, went, we were in Clearwater at the time, and, and we were like, you know, we really don't, they hated the Scientology. They still do. And, well, not all of them, because they've bought a lot of buildings and stuff there. But, but the populace in, in Clearwater. General, they don't like them. Okay. And they really didn't in the 70s. And, and uh, I said, look, we've, you know, we've, uh, we were all sitting around. And we were like, we don't even look like a religion. Do you know what I mean? And they came up with Sunday service. Okay. So they do have a Sunday service, but it's basically for PR. That's it. That's and what does it consist of? Who knows? Some you know, speech? They had some people come in and talk about something that's sort of spiritual. And that happens in Clearwater? Well, it happens all Everywhere. over. They have Sunday okay. service, but it's... It's strictly for PR. It is not what you think of for a church. Okay, all. now let's go back to the next question, which is what prompted you to leave? Okay, what prompted me to leave, Scientology is like a triangle, right? And I had worked my way all the way up to the second of the top. I was OT7, OT8 is the top. And my best friend, Bill Yachty, and this I wanted to correct from Ebner, because Ebner had said I was single-handedly handling the internet, and that's Incorrect. I was the only person who opened up the phony accounts, which my best friend and auditor, he was a highly, highly trained auditor, and is, and is still in, Bill Yachty, and he said, look, we've got to handle these critics on the internet, Tori. They're just destroying our church and 
creating all these lies on the internet. I, you know, it was in the 90s. I knew nothing about the internet, nothing, literally. And uh, so he said, I want you to just open up an account. See if you can open up an account. I think you can do it. <laughs> and, and go in with, you know, cash and make your, you know, just push your way in. And I did, and I got the account. I got uh, an email and a password, and I gave it to him. And I came back, and he had a grin as big as this room. And I was like, what? And he was like, you've just changed the entire history of the internet. And I was like, how can I change the history of the internet when I don't even know what it is? Okay, so long story short, that rolled into we're going to fly you around the United States opening up these phony accounts, right? Okay, now what we're talking about is that the internet had become a vestige of great criticism for the church, and their response was to open up phony accounts. What's happening with these phony accounts? Okay, there what was, was a their good purpose? question. There's only one news group back then, so people that are thinking now, they, you know, there's all kinds of web pages. There, what, that wasn't happening back then. There was one news group. And someone from a Scientologist who'd left Scientology, the church, would come on saying L. Ron Hubbard was a liar, or you know, whatever, any kind of fact. David Miscavige is a jerk, you know, or whatever. They didn't want anyone to see that. So they would do what's called spamming, where they would post about anti-psychiatry things. And their view was if they could drive that topic down to the bottom and the second page, no one would ever read it, which isn't too far from wrong. I mean, how many times do you go to the page two? Not often. You so know, they're affecting the top. search engine. Exactly. Okay. And so that was the goal, but I didn't know it. See, he said, I'm not going to tell you. And I said, why not? And he said, because if I tell you, they're really evil, and they're going to get you in deposition, and you'll be there forever. And so I said, he said, you don't want that. And I said, no. So he said, all right, so I'm not going to tell you. And then you can honestly say you don't know if, you, if they do depose you. OK, so I'm opening these phony accounts. But I grew up in Chicago. I grew up on the north side around the mafia. Some of the mafia lived in my town. And I knew how they acted. And this one guy that was running it from the top, top of Scientology in the Sea Org acted a lot like the mafia. And I had never seen this guy before, and I'd been in 30 years. And all of a sudden, I thought, oh my god. And I hated David Miscavige. And I thought, what if that jerk paid the mafia? to come in here and slime the internet and hurt these critics. And now, they terrify people, and this is a thing people need to know. Because everyone reads the internet, and you think they are too, but they're not. They self-censor themselves, because they're convinced that what's on the internet is evil, horrible, it's going to ruin their route to freedom, it's going to stop it. And they're not wrong, because the people on the internet are all declared suppressives, which is a bunch of bullshit. But you don't know that when you're in the church. And so you think, well, I don't want to be around the suppressive, so I'm not going to read it, right? But now I'm by myself, and this is a top secret thing. Nobody knows about it. I, I had to sign a $100,000 bond that I would never tell my friends, my husband, nothing. About these secret anybody. accounts. Yeah, nothing. Right. You couldn't tell the head of, you couldn't tell David Miscavige, you couldn't tell RTC, nothing. There was like, it was, a, it was like this weird group of five people. And I only did it because I trusted my best friend, Bill Yachty, right? So I'm opening up these accounts. And now I start thinking, what if he did hire the mafia? So I go on the internet to look. And the day that I looked on alt-religion Scientology, they had spammed it with baking recipes on how to bake a German chocolate cake, cupcakes, yada, yada. And in between were people saying, I didn't say that. Scientology is changing my words. And I thought, they're stopping free speech. And I'm a free speech advocate, believe it or not. So I was like, I can't do this. And all of a sudden, I got really terrified because I realized Yachty, my best friend, this had to come from Miscavige. I didn't know that, but now I did. And I knew they locked people up. And I thought, they're going to get me. And they're, you know, I was really afraid. So I called up Bill, and I said, I can't do this anymore. And he said, OK, no problem. You know, just come to Glendale. Come to this apartment. We need to meet you. Just find out what happened. So I said, okay. Now, this is my best friend, right? So I walk in, and I'm almost over it. It's, not, it's a long story, but it, it's, it's the end of it. This is why I left. I walk into the apartment. There's like five or six men, big men. L the lights are really dim. And I'm thinking, this is a little weird. Yachty isn't there. And so I'm like, hey, how are you doing? And they're all like really acting weird towards me. And I'm thinking, something's wrong here. I'm very good at perception, and I'm going, something's wrong. And all of a sudden, bam, a door slams open. Gavino comes walking in, who's the guy I didn't trust. 
And he goes, I warned you about her. I warned you about her to my to Bill Yachty. And I'm like, you warned Wait, him Bill about Yachty's what? Bill Yachty's not there, though. No, he's with him. Oh, they both come, come in, in together. Okay. And I'm like, you warned him about what? And it was a two-hour, just literally spiritual rape, where they just were pounding me to death on, you know, what are you going to say? What about this? It, it's too long to get into, but it was awful. And I finally just burst out crying. I ran outside. Yachty realized he screwed up. And he came running after me. I said, get away from me. Get away from me. And I got in my car, and that was really the night I left, that night. It took me another six months to get on the internet and fully wake up, but that was the night I woke up and said, I'm done. I didn't get into Scientology to do this. Now tell me, after you left, what was the reaction? I mean, I know that you were chased and harassed, and right now there is actually a lawsuit, and you speak about it on your web show. Um, uh, which is, is about, that is going on now, about another ex-Scientologist, uh, Marty Rathbone's wife, I guess, being harassed. And, and so tell me what happened when you left the church then. Okay, okay so now you have to get, I wake up. I had taught Andreas Heldeland, just to finish the story, I was on the internet making 4,000 posts in four weeks. I never posted for the internet as Mark, as Mark Ebner said, I didn't. I opened the accounts, but I never made any posts against the critics. I finally, after that night with Yachty, I didn't want to talk to them anymore. I was away from OSA, the Office of Special Affairs, and I'm on my own, but I'm thinking these critics know something because they won't go away in like two years. So I decide to go on the internet. I make 4,000 posts in four weeks, and in the end, Andreas Heldelin says, you know, he helps me. I write him and say, why are you hurting my religion? He says, I believe in truth. I believe in looking at both sides, and I believe in having, and I have the courage to say what I think. I don't think Scientologists are bad, I just think they're misinformed. And I sat in my dining room and I cried for four hours because that is who I was at 22. And now I was 53, I was at the top of Scientology, and I realized I can't look, I can't talk, you know. Everything, it was like such a trap. It was so awful. I couldn't stop crying. And he'd said, please look on the internet and get educated. And the first thing I read was from um, Mary Tavioyan saying, ladies, if you're thinking about going back in the Sea Org, and it was all about enforced abortions, which I didn't know they did to the Sea Org. You can't get pregnant anymore. They make you get an abortion. I'm gonna cry. Anyway, it was awful. Did they do that to you? No, but they did it to, these, to Mary, and she described it, how she had to go, and then the next day she had to be on post, and it was just like, how could you do that? I mean, you know, it's like, this is what I thought was my church, right? You know, and it's like, this is awful. Now, you have to get, I didn't know any of this other stuff that most people know now, so I'm still thinking it's a good group, right? But then I start reading that, and then, I wake up. Andrea says, what kind of friends could those be if they're going to leave you because you changed your mind? And that was it. It just cracked my Truman Show. I'm awake. And now I'm really afraid. And I write to Andreas in Norway and I say, I got to get out of here. I'm 15 minutes from them. They're going to come get me. They're going to lock me up. And so he gets me with someone. They say, okay, we'll fly you to Clearwater. I get a van that's going to take me to LAX. They cancel it. And they say, oh, someone anonymously called and canceled canceled your van. So basically you're reaching out to the critics that are on the internet and people that you know trying to get assistance to get away. Now I am okay. at this point. And the Scientology people are blocking that escape route or they, somebody They canceled is. the van, right. okay. the plane is canceled. I walk into LAX and the vice president of Scientology is there saying, we know where you're going, you're not going there. And Jesse had said to me, bring Who's a Jesse? phone, Jesse Prince, okay. who used to be next to David Miscavige okay. and left. And his whole story's on the internet, Jesse Prince. And, um, so, and he's written it and he's got t videos and all kinds of stuff. Okay. So anyway, Jesse had said to me, bring a phone. And, this is, and it's gonna sound funny to people now, but back then people didn't have phones. I had an emergency <laughs> phone. It doesn't sound funny to I me. I know, I had an emergency phone. And so she said, he said, bring it. So I thought, these guys are nuts. You know, they don't do this kind of evil stuff that they're talking about. I really didn't think they did until they canceled my van. And that was like, if you think of a black shirt, like your shirt and a pinhole of light coming through, that was like that van getting canceled. It was like, maybe what all these critics have been telling me is true. Maybe they are these evil people. Maybe they do do these creepy things. So then when the 
I'd go in, I'd call Jesse, I go, Jesse, the vice president's here. And he goes, all right, do not sit down the phone. We are going to walk you through this. We're going to get you on the airplane. And it took quite a while, but she stayed right with me, got the whole schedule, of course. So then they were there in Chicago. They were there in Tampa. The Tampa police were there. OSA was there. They were there. And the Tampa police got me out with Stacy. Jess, Bob Minton, Stacy Brooks, and Jesse Prince. So do you think in order for somebody at your level to really leave, they need to contact authorities? I think that's a great idea. You know, I, I, I know people won't because you're too brainwashed by the level that I'm at. But I do think you can, there's enough friends now that are out here that you can call and we'll help you because I know Scientologists, it's one of the first things they talk about is don't ever call the police, ever. You know, it's really like they're really evil and they're just going to hurt you and Are harm Are the police you suppressive? And... To, uh, of, course. The, okay. of course. Now, let me ask you this question. When, um, when you're in there and you, had to, you said you made it to level seven and there are eight levels, how much and did my it, husband was eight. How much did it cost you to get to level seven? At least 200000 or more. And where did that money come from? Well, part of it, I'd, they have a thing called co-auditing where you could audit me, I can audit you. And then it's very hardly anything. So I did the whole bottom of the bridge that would cost people another $100,000. I did co-auditing. So um, I earned a bunch of it. I paid for my OT levels. And then when I got to, I think, OT4, my mo oh, four through eight, my mother-in-law paid for my husband and myself. That was our inheritance. So we didn't really get a choice to say we want to was buy a, a house. Was she a member? Oh, yeah, she was okay. OTA. All right, she now, was in since 1950. What does the OT stand for? Operating thing. OK. Uh, now, when you get out, you get declared a suppressive person. And you get this. Uh, you Not get, everybody. But you did. If you speak out. If you speak out. Now, you have this document with you, if I could just borrow it. Sure. We'll, we'll put it up. And this is, did this come to you? Was it mailed to you or no, given no. to you? No, no. The only reason I got it yeah. is I came home. My, they'd, vac they'd stripped my house. And I wanted my receipts to find out how much money they had of mine. So I called Treasury at Flag in Clearwater and said, can you send me my receipts? They put me through to the justice chief. And she was like some 17-year-old kid. And she said, do you want to know why you're talking to the justice chief? And I knew, but I wanted to hear it. And I said, yeah, why? And she goes, because you're declared suppressive. And I said, well, you know, you might be too young to know this policy, but there is a policy. If it isn't in writing, it isn't true, which, of course, everyone reads. So I knew it would piss her off, and it did. And she said, um, I'll have it to you within 24 hours. So, so that's you why it's her laminated. Giving you something. OK, now you have a laminated, and it says, and how, and how do you pronounce your? your Bazazian. Bazazian was your married name of Los Angeles, was hereby declared a suppressive person. In early 2000 of July, you left Scientology on her own volition and began associating with others who seek the destruction of our religion. Tori abandoned her husband and longtime friends who had supported and helped her over the years and knowingly aligned with several declared squirrels. Okay, now hang on. I didn't abandon my husband. And I've brought this up with my husband because it says online I had an affair. And I say to him, bring him over. I'd like to meet him. I had an affair with him. <laughs> and, and also the other thing, what happened is I was on either CNN or Inside Edition. And they asked me what had happened if Katie, Katie Holmes leaves. What's right. going to happen? And I said, well, and let's say you're the, you know, you're the interviewer. And I said, well, I lost all of my, 20, my 30 year friends. And then I looked in the camera and I said, and my husband of 27 years left me. So he called me that night and he said, I didn't leave you. You left me and you had an affair. And I, you know, just on and on all the lies that are on there, he, he said. And I said, look, first of all, you can tell Bill Yachty and Gavino to go fuck themselves. And pardon me for your That's audience. Fine. No, my and, audience is used to that. Okay, good. <laughs> And, uh, and I said, secondly, my front door is right, open. Guys, right. and, that's, and that's true to this day. And you can come over. Anybody can come over. Osa can come over. I don't care. I don't have a problem with it. They're the ones who can't talk. And you can see it on any of my videos where we're picketing. They cannot talk to us anymore. Let's take a look. I mean, after you left, you began to try to work to save other Scientologists and, and offer them the option of getting out if they wanted to. And you go out in front of the Church of Scientology and actually pick it there. And I wanted to, just so you guys could see that this very um, attractive and cute woman in action trying to help others who might want to leave the church and, and, and in a really peaceful and respectful way. But I want them to take a look at, at you in action with some of your friends, I guess. Okay. You guys remember that song? 
party at the Church of Scientology. Hit me. Here we go. Hi, young man. You can leave tonight. We'll take you. Yeah. You can go to the movies, go to the beach. Fun. I'm, I'm having fun right now. Oh, you yeah. are. <laughs> bullshit of bullshit. I've been there for 30 years. Fun. Don't waste your life, man. You got a slim chance to get out. You don't have on the white shirt. I was in it 30 years. I know what I'm talking about. You can leave tonight, and I'm not kidding. And you'll be free, you can do fun stuff, go to the beach, go to movies, go visit your family, brothers, sisters, people you don't talk to anymore. Hey, Oda, why don't you come over here and chat? Do you remember me, Tori? Don't give me a drink. She remembers. <laughs> I love your face. Great. I love your outfit. I'm not the same. It's your symbol as your phrase. Anyway, she's how are you? Right. You know, I have my check out my my shirt. Come on. So the, the woman, Althea, Althea, Alethea. Alethea, who you're speaking to, was an old friend, right? Yes. And she wouldn't speak to you. Nobody N speaks you to you. You see her. She looks awful. And she, for the whole time I was there, she would not smile. She wouldn't talk to me. She was just taking pictures of us and pretending she was on her cell phone. It was, it was really sad. A few people have written me who knew her because she used to be such a bubbly you know, wonderful so is there person. something, so let me just go through now, let's talk a little bit about the actual church. I mean, I, I find this incredible that, that you have a definition of what a suppressive person is here, is laminated, and, and um, it, it, it just sort of blows my mind. It's, Tori is engaged in the following suppressive acts, public disavowal of Scientology or Scientologists in good standing with Scientology organizations, public statements against Scientology. This doesn't, you know, it'd be really go. incredible if, you were a member of a temple and you get thrown out for disagreeing with something. I mean, because I, it's hard, I'm hard pressed to think of somebody who belongs to a temple who doesn't disagree with somebody. Exactly. <laughs> that the rabbi says, that's sort of our sport, actually. Right. So let's go through, you actually, when you were in the Church of Scientology, trained John Travolta, and, and you've spoken about I it. I helped. You helped, and what did that consist of? Why do you think that he is, allowed himself to become such a public spokesperson for the church and what was it like to train or help train him? Okay, in the old days at Celebrity Center it was much different than it is now. It was very inclusive. You come to Los Angeles and basically most of the people in the industry are like, when you make it, come see us, right? And, t and until then, see ya. Whereas Celebrity Center realized, wait a minute, you know, Yvonne Jantz ran it, Hubbard was I'm sure part of it. And it was like, let's get these celebrities, artists, get them in. So it was like, hey, you know, they believed everybody was an artist some That's way. Smart. Yeah, it was very smart. And so, you know, Travolta showed up. I mean, he was an actor, but he wasn't anything. He got Welcome Back Cotter while, while we were on course, while he was on course with us, while we were supervising him. And he, and he was on the second course when I helped supervise him. And I mean, he was adorable. He just is. He's a wonderful person. I really like him. You know, I'm sorry that he sucked, sucked into Scientology. All these guys, because they're all really nice. I know Kirsty. Um, Kirsty's really not, I mean, she's a, she's a walking image of how Scientology doesn't work. You know, we, we gave her an award at, this summer for being the biggest shill of Scientology. Because she is. I know there's she's a video. She's tweeting people everywhere. Why is she a walking uh, example of why it doesn't work? What are you referring well, to? Does she look happy? I mean, I look at her back in the old days, she was pretty happy. Now she's very overweight, so was I. I was 100 pounds overweight when I was in Scientology. I lost it, not because of Scientology, I lost it because I joined Weight Watchers. And I've kept it off for three years. You should be a spokesperson. For I know, yes. I know. 
But um, so besides the weight, it, but but getting back to my Travolta question, what is it you think that brought him there, and why does he allow himself to be a shill for them? I think it's a slow road. It's like anything. Why does anybody keep stay in in Scientology? It's just a little bit more, and maybe you could do this. And plus, you have to remember these guys are getting once they make it a little bit. Like now he's got Welcome Back Harder. Now he was a big star for us because they had no stars, right? So he was like numero uno big star that I can remember. Maybe they had someone earlier, but anyway, he was a big one. And so then they get the red carpet treatment. And imagine, you know how it is in the industry. It's a lot of work to stay number one up at the top. But Scientology celebrities, they don't have to work at it at all. They just walk in somewhere and they're like red carpet treatment, John Travolta, Tom Cruise, you know, whatever. So basically, I mean, because, and I think that's an interesting thing for our audience, that basically when somebody comes to Los Angeles, and unless you have, a, maybe you're just a, an actor starting out and you're not well known, that to be treated with any kind of respect it's is awful. a step up. Yeah, like, anything, I mean, yeah, anything. It's a clever thing to Sure, it's act very clever. As if somebody is special. Cares about you and you're special and you have talent. I know a lady right now we're talking to her. And she, they bought Chick Corea's old studio. This is how sneaky they are. Chick Corea moved to Clearwater. You know who Chick Corea is, yes, right? Yes, I do. Okay. Chick moved. They bought his studio. It's now a Sea Org studio, right? So you have to be in the Sea Org, which is a billion-year contract. It's 24 hours a day. You live there. You work there. That's it, right? But they take these artists now. And they move them over into the Chick Corea studio, and they go, well, I'm not really like the Sea Org. I'm, I'm over here. I'm going to be a dancer. Or I'm going to be a singer. You know what I mean? Something like that. So it's separate. So in terms of the Sea Org, and this kind of fascinated me because I was on my way to the opera with my husband driving down Hollywood Boulevard, and we saw all these guys, and my husband goes, wow, those guys look like um, they're valet parkers or ushers of some sort. There must be some <laughs> event here for the evening, and because they had on the black pants and the white tops. It's kind of like a valet parker usher outfit. <laughs> and, and you told me, so they're the Sea Org. What, if they're in doing it 24 hours a day, what is it that they're doing? We, that's a good question, and we all have been asking that too, because there are very few public anymore. I mean, there so are some guys on the street passing out pamphlets. I, I saw know. that, some of the usher guys. But I mean, we're like, the, they have the huge management building. All they're doing, Miscavige has got this whole program buying buildings, but you can see the building, go to Pasadena. It's generally empty. There's like three or four people in there. You can go to Santa Ana. They bought. They went from a one story to four stories, and it's pretty empty. You know, wherever they they call them the ideal org, and I really don't know what it is unless it's just a real estate gig. But they they're no longer in the business of really helping people. Not really. Miscavige himself hasn't had auditing, which is their counseling, since 1997. Mark Headley told me that. Really? Mm -hmm. So so he couldn't believe in it too much. Do you see what I mean? He's just counting people. So he doesn't continue, not audited? Okay, Nothing. now, there's a, an understanding from the lay people who hear about Scientology that the reason people stay in Scientology is because they're being blackmailed. What's your response to that? And that's certainly something that people say about the stars, that Scientology during the auditing process, and this is a question from my friend James, um, who, who asked, he said, is it, are they being blackmailed? Um, do you tell them something during the auditing process that they might use against you? And you did mention something to me about when you leave that they posted sort of personal information about you. They used to on the walls. Not when you leave. No, no. They used to. Well, yeah, I guess when they declare someone. When they declare you suppressive. That's they, so, they would put it on the wall. Are they black? I mean, what, no, what, what's I, the truth I don't to think that? so. You A lot me. of people think so. That's why I'm I don't asking. think that's true. I don't. Because think about it. I mean, yes. John Travolta's got a lot of secrets that he's told them. But how fast would it take John Travolta to pick up the phone and have media around the world, right? I mean, within about 10 minutes right. at the most. Probably less, yeah. Yeah, it'd probably be like five minutes. Right. And around the world, I mean, I know me. I made a video. I'm me, nothing, Tori, right? I made a video when his son died to John Travolta on the internet, on Tori Magoo 44. It's a video called To John Travolta. A message to John Travolta. The next day, I had 38 radio and TV stations around the world calling me to interview me. 
That's me. So think of Travolta. How fast would it take him to have major media around the world? And he, he's got his own story to tell about Scientology. They don't want his story out there. You know, the dark, his story, the dark side, right? Yeah, but how about this? Say the allegations against John Travolta about the massage, allegations that suddenly went away after, because probably because of the fine work of his attorney, Marty Singer, or because they were untrue. Take your pick, you guys decide. Um, but the question is, if those a accusations are true, if he does have a proclivity, or if he is gay, or whatever it is, his dark secrets, they know them. And no matter how much press he calls, for a leading man, is that going to kill his career? I mean, do they have the information that could kill his career? Um, because look at the access to the media that you got by just mentioning his name. Imagine Scientology would have the same right. kind of response. So when I asked the question about what kind of information they have, I mean, everybody has their secrets, but for celebrities, they also have a public image and a private reality. So it does put anybody that you confide in in a position of power over, you know, right. to reveal your private personality. Um, and that can really destroy careers because, you know, we want to go see that image that's been created. But especially I'm just saying for they're him. not going to say they're going to blackmail you. They're never going to say that. They're not going to imply that they're going to blackmail you. So it's sort of like, okay. I mean, the, the threat would be they're going to declare you suppressive. But even then, this is so watered down compared to the old days. The old days, they would have really run out all the awful things that somebody had done and say him, put them in writing. This is all like nickel and dime kind of stuff that they say about everybody. Okay, let's talk about Tom Cruise and David Miscavige's relationship, something that fascinates Mark Evner, <laughs> that he tends to hypothesize about, and he's heard things, and of course he's spoken to people in, in Scientology, but I, I am not yet convinced that his, about his sourcing in terms of uh, is sort of intimating that there's a, re a, a more than just a friendship relationship there. But I am curious what those in Scientology thought of the relationship between Tom and Dave Miscavige and why is Tom Cruise so devoted to being, he should have won shill of the, the shill, uh, maybe of you course. must have given that to him one year yeah. for shilling for Scientology. So I'm just curious, what is that relationship like? What did you see when you were inside the organization in terms of Miscavige and Cruise's relationship and what the heck was he doing in Katie Holmes' honeymoon? Well, first of all, I was out when that happened. So I, I don't know what happened inside. Um, and when I was in, you didn't really see them having that kind of relationship. You know, and I don't think they do even to this day. It's sort of like there's so much hype in Scientology. It would be like, look at, you know, look at how much Tom Cruise loved David Miscavige. He must be a fabulous person, right? You know, I was there when David Miscavige, or when Tom Cruise came out. Not came out as gay, but came out as a Scientologist. And it had all been like, don't say anything, don't ask, don't tell, he's in, but don't let anybody know, right? Then they had a huge event at Flag, and Tom Cruise came out and said, I'm a Scientologist and I'm a class four auditor and if I can get trained, you can get trained, right? And we, and I was in Scientology at the time, way in Scientology, and we walked out and said, somebody handled that guy. Because it's like, it was so obvious. You know, now he was a spokesperson for the church. And I think it's just, it's a matter of power. You know, somebody, you know, giving you enough power and it makes you feel great and you know what I mean? That's, okay. that's what I think it is. I don't think, I don't think he's gay because his, his first wife said he's, you know, a few people have said he's more like asexual. And what is your, um, I know his first wife said that they stopped having sex. I remember uh, yeah. that, that she was quoted as saying that there was something weird that he went on these periods of abstinence. What was your take, at least from uh, on the Katie Holmes, Tom Cruise divorce and how that was handled and why Scientology didn't make more of a um, show of going after her as a suppressive oh God, person? Oh, no wonder. Because they were very smart in what they did. I know what happened. I mean, Tell I me. don't know what happened, but I'm just saying per, per what happened, Katie, we were making videos to Katie, writing to her, stuff like that, trying to get her to look, right? And I think they finally, and I know she talked to Nicole about her kids, right? And so I think with that, they, she went on the internet, her dad went on the internet, they started to learn the darker side of Scientology. And, and I can't say it enough. People say, oh, I would never do that. You never know, you never know. And I've talked to academics who study 
cults and they say anybody can get suckered in if you're at the wrong place at the wrong time unless you really know what is a cult if you learn that what is a cult then you won't get you know they won't get you but um katie i think you know they studied it and they realized we're going to wait till tom's in iceland <laughs> and then we're going to announce it do you see what i mean it was perfect and they they really did it right they really really did and I'm really happy she's free. I am. But why do you think Scientology didn't go after her? Because they, you know, to they public? didn't. Yeah, they didn't want any publicity on the thing. She left Tom Cruise. That's awful for them. How bad is that? This is their big star. And his wife leaves. They've made such a big deal about their marriage. Yeah. So it's better to stay away and not comment oh, on yeah. it. Oh, yeah. And Tom They're Davis. They're big at sweeping, sweeping things under the rug. Deaths. Tons of people die. They just sweep them under the rug. Which brings me to my next question. Is there a place where they hold people prisoner? Is there a place where yes. they abuse people? Yes. Um, where there's always been, um, James actually asked, there's a, 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 he wanted to know, um, is there uh, a, the secret place, um, the, a secret compound that was rumored to have existed and Scientology vehemently denied it. Years later, it was revealed that the rumors were entirely true. So I, I'm just wondering, we are hearing more and more from ex-Scientology members, especially people from the top, like you, who've reached the top levels. Are people abused? Are they held prisoner? And where does that happen? And how can that happen in this day and age? I know it's really hard to believe, isn't it? Um, yes, they definitely hold people prisoner. It's called the RPF. It's only for Sea Org. That's one thing I want to make clear, because a lot of people think it's everybody. And it's not. It's only for the Sea Org members for this. And it's called the Rehabilitation Project Force. And this is how they explained it to me. Now, in the old days, you could see they were black. They were all in black. And they were all shoveling away. And they, they, it looked a little weird. But, you know, there was nothing. You, you couldn't talk about it. They're really big on don't ask, don't tell. You know, if, if you want to talk about it, go to ethics. They'll explain it, right? And they have some BS Are you talking about you saw people shoveling something? Yes, I'm not yes. Shoveling. They're, out, they're out doing manual labor. They okay. have to work half the day. And you don't here. ask them what no, they're no, doing? No, no, no. You can't talk. You're not allowed to talk to them. Ever. Even when you're in the organization? They're not allowed to talk to each other. No. Well, when do they get because to talk? Because they're in a slave camp. Oh. You know what I mean? They, okay. can't, if they, they can't talk to each other, and they're not allowed to talk to any of the members. Ever. And you they're can't allowed ask to them. marry? No, no. Not, not, not on the RPF. This is, the RPF is the slave camp. It's a separate camp than Scientology Sea Org. There's the is that Sea Org. where bad Sea Org people go? Well, if they're not doing something they want or their statistics are down. Or one time David Miscavige, uh, one of my friends, said, would you like a different fork? And he said, that guy has a bad tone level. Get him on the RPF. Literally. So pretty creepy. But they do manual labor half the day and then auditing or counseling, co-auditing the other half. So now I leave, and I'd heard they have a thing called the hole, where they have people locked in. Now I talk to Mark Headley and Claire Headley. And media had asked me for years, do you think Scientology can ever turn into Jonestown? And I've always said, no, no way. So I, I, now Headley, they were up at the top, right, in, out at Gold in Hemet, which is Hemet, California, in case you're a Scientologist, <laughs> because that's a big <laughs> secret area. Um, so I say, you know, I ask them, do you think it could ever turn into jo Jonestown? Before I can finish the sentence, Mark Headley says, absolutely. And I say, really? And I look at his wife, who was above him. She was in the R RTC, which is the top, top executives. And I looked at her and I said, really? And she goes, 100%. If Miscavige gave the order, definitely. It would be done. People would kill like themselves. In the, say, in the Sea Org up at Gold. I don't, I don't know if they were speaking for all of the Sea Org, but I think they were just talking for, about gold. Which is that is, because they're so miserable there? No, they're just under a spell. Okay. Do you know what I mean? And it's so because they're, they've been completely indoctrinated totally. and they would do as, yeah. exactly as yeah, they were told. whatever he said. And so she was in the hole. And I said, how, could, how come you guys don't ban up and you know, like revolt? I know a lot of the guys in the hole. And Ray Midoff, the head of tech, is in the hole. You know what I mean? These guys, Heber Jens, who ran the church for years, is in the hole. And she said, well, Miscavige like plans. I know. It's worse than that. I keep thinking Miscavige of being plants, sent to the hole. Exactly. Right? Okay. Miscavige plants people in there that aren't really in the hole. So you never know who really is. So let's say I say to you, hey, you know, we could band together. Well, you might rat on me. And then I don't know what he does. It probably beats him up or whatever. But 
They, did you see people who left there who had been there and got to come back? Did they ever speak about their experience there? Well, Claire and Mark are telling me about it, yeah. You mm. mean the RPF, I've talked to a ton of people. That's what I'm asking that. about, oh, yeah. yeah. And they've told oh, yeah. you that they they've were run abused? run around the pole for hours, you know, literally running around a pole. Mark Headley, they have a thing for, I don't know, going to the bathroom and it all leaked out up at Gold. And David Miscavige made them go out with buckets, no masks, and pick up shit for, a, I think it was like half a week or something. He now has a condition of breathing because of that. It's awful. I mean, the guy's really a creepy guy. Let's talk about David Miscavige because um, Tony Ortega and Mark Ebner have spoken and spoken to lots of Scientologists, ex-Scientologists, and also people that are still inside about Miscavige. And Ebner and Ortega both believe Tony believe that Miscavige is the beginning of the end for Scientology. Oh, and absolutely. That, and why is that? What is it about him? What has he done that was different from previous leaders? to really cause this hemorrhaging of, of, of high profile people leaving and even you know lower profile people leaving and the fact that these buildings are becoming more and more empty. Apparently that the organization is losing its memberships. If that's okay, true. Okay, well it's a, it is. Okay. A couple things is that um, David Miscavige, first of all, whatever David Miscavige is doing is based on L. Ron Hubbard's technology that he wrote. So I don't consider L. Ron Hubbard all clean. He personally told me to get off my medicine. So he wrote me a letter. And L. Said, Ron Hubbard? Yes. Okay, yeah, we should 70s. explain to my audience that Tori has um, epilepsy. epilepsy, so she was taking medicine to prevent um, grand mal seizures. And then she was told by, in a letter by L. Ron Hubbard that she should cease to take that medicine. No, no, he said continue on, a, that, that letter was a different thing where he, they were trying to make me pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for leaving the Sea Org. And I said, bullshit, you know, you broke the contract. Because they said I, I, I couldn't take the medicine, I had to get off my medicine before I could be in the Sea Org. So Hubbard wrote me and said, continue on up, you don't have to pay the freeloader's debt. That's wrong, because I wrote him and said, bullshit, you know, I don't know, I have to pay this. And he said, you're right, but continue on in the HGC, which is where you get auditing, and we'll see you up the line. So it was sort of like fix epilepsy, and then we'll see you up the line. So it changed, I got in Scientology to be an auditor and to help other people, but now it changed to I have to fix me before I could help other people. Do you see what I mean? Yes, I do. Totally changed it. So that's, I, I'm, I, and then I found out Hubbard was popping pills. I fought them for 30 years on my medicine, because they were always putting me down for taking medicine. And I found out he was popping pills for those 30 years. So that really ticked me off. <laughs> but. Well, anyway, did you want to say something? No, go ahead. So Miscavige, the other thing about Miscavige is two things. One, his reign, he started in the late 80s. The 90s is when the net started happening. So he inherited that. The what? The internet. That I don't know if L. Ron Hubbard could have done any better, you know, on that end. I hate David Miscavige because I think he's a... He's, you know, he's a creepy, awful person. He really is. I mean, I've been around him personally, and I just think he's, he's, he's a liar. He's a fraud. He's a weasel. You know, he, he's, you know, some limp dick guy that probably can't even get it up. I doubt if he even has sex. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just a creepy, awful person who rips people off on a daily basis. Jesse Prince told me, laughs about it. When they donate millions, they used to find, you know, think it was really funny. It's not really funny. These people are going broke because of this jerk. So Miscavige, A, inter inherited the internet right around the same time. And the internet really is what is nailed Scientology and Anonymous, which Ebner talked about. Because Anonymous, even I got out in 2000. I've been speaking out since. But not until 2008. I mean, I would do media interviews. They would do three, four Tom Cruise, a couple lines of me, even though they interviewed me for an hour, right? Nothing. It was awful. But once Anonymous hit, bam, every, you know, Mark Hadley wrote his book and came out. He was saying, I'm blown for good, but he wouldn't say, I'm Mark Hadley, right? You know, and it was true for a lot of people that were big, big, fabulous critics. They wrote books, Jeff Hawkins, Amy Scobie, you know, and this was all before even Marty and Mike left. 
these what other about people. Mr. Davis, I'm leaving. I mean, and being having. I mean, we Tommy. talked about this briefly. Tommy yeah. Davis, that he was the he's the son of Ann Archer. He had a position as the head PR guy. He has kind of disappeared to Texas. He's made no comments. He hasn't said anything disparaging about the church. And I was just curious, was that um, a huge change for the church's control over its PR? Would the absence of him or did whoever replace him continue along the same lines? Was that a big loss for the church to have Tommy no longer as their spokesperson? I don't think so because I think he was screwing up pretty badly. Yes, so, there were interviews where he lost it on television and right. whatnot. So, yeah. so the was, big person that had been there PR for years was yes. Mike Rinder, right? And then he left. Tommy came in, didn't really do, it. and they had. I don't really think they've filled it since. So they're at a, they have a loss of somebody to control. Pretty much. Let me ask you what happened with Tom Cruise when he had that meltdown with Katie Holmes. Was that anything related? It was such a strange thing. Was it suddenly where he started to like? yell at Matt Lauer and get angry about the use of prescription drugs. Oh, that was so what, great. Oh. What, was that the real him that you knew from Scientology? Um, unmasked because he no longer had um, uh, Pat Kingsley, his publicist, to control him? That was part of it. Okay, or, or what caused it? I mean, well, I've always I, been really my curious theory. after you, all those years. Yeah, yeah, this is my theory. When you're on OT7, to get to OT8, you have to do a big, ex what they call exchange. You have to do something to create a big effect, oh. right? And so I think Miscavige said to him, you need to handle psychiatry and nail it, right? And so I think it was a program thing where, I mean, the, the Oprah thing was him, whatever, being a knucklehead. But when Oprah happened, because I kept writing to David Miscavige on the internet saying, time is on our side, tick tock, <laughs> tick tock. And karma cannot get paid off. You can't buy karma. And so when he jumped on the couch, I went, yes. Because I kept saying, it's gonna happen, something's gonna happen, and it's gonna be by your least expected person. And so when Tom Cruise started jumping on the couch, and then the next day or right after that, went on the Matt Lauer show and said, I know the source of psychiatry, you don't. I was like, bingo. So and I think he could have gotten past the couch thing. Yeah. Because that was weird oh, yeah, celebrity sure. stuff, oh, yeah. trying to show how in love he oh, is yeah. with someone to, to no sell question. that Katie Holmes relationship. But the Matt Lauer thing was such a strange thing in light of the fact that I, everybody had interviewed him up to that point and you never got him to get that out of control. Right. So I, I wondered what, what, your, you know, what your take was on that. Um, what I wanted to know too, and I guess this is uh, about the personality test and, and just for people that are coming by, what is the, the function of the personality test? Is that the big like lure that they throw out there to get people into the church? Is that something that people, I, I mean, because I guess even before I ask about the personality test, the big question is how does somebody really intelligent end up in a cult? And you're clearly like really intelligent and you're not the only one. And you said that anybody at any time could end up. What are the ways to avoid that? And what role does the personality test play in getting people into Scientology? Okay, well, first of all, like I said, it isn't me saying that. Academics who study cults have told me often people who are in cults are very high IQ. They're not stupid. A lot of people think they're really stupid, but it's the exact opposite. That's why they got in a cult. And they say anybody can get suckered in if you're at the wrong place at the wrong time and you run into them. Now, how can you prevent that? There's tons of education on the internet. You can go to YouTube, type in mind control, and just start getting tra trained in mind control. Because Scientology isn't the only bad group out there. There's a few of them. And if you get educated in what is mind control, you're not going to be able to get, fall into that trap because you're going to be able to see. It's only nine things that uh, Robert Lifton defined for what is a cult. Okay. And once you learn those, you know, which is loaded language, and you've got some guy that's the, the key guy, you know, there's a different there, ones. They have a certain, there's certain things they yeah, pick so, off. Now, what about the personality test? Because I took that when I was in high school as a joke with a, a guy friend of mine. We were just in Hollywood because I grew up here, and we both were deemed to be completely suicidal. All like right, they, now, because you have my picture of me with my red horns on, I just want to tell you first, I was uh, making fun of being declared suppressive. I'm, I see, okay. See, that's why I have okay. my red horns. Well, I think it's very, you still And to super prove, because I knew yes. they're liars, which is the other thing I wanted to tell you, how can you avoid it? The truth is, how can you tell if a Scientologist is lying if their lips are moving? That's the truth. And I knew once I left, 
they would lie and say, oh, Tori's just out there handling the critics. So that's why I got those red okay. horns. To say, no, no, I'm not handling the critics, I'm with the critics. And there's a bunch of videos of me in 2000 going, Tori, Tori Bazazian, critic. <laughs> you know? okay. okay. And my supervisor got out because of my red horns. So that was my big product. And okay. he got back with his wife and married her. So that was really well, neat. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah, it was really cool. So, so what should they do about the But the personality test, they don't test. do anymore. They do the stress test. So they don't even do the personality test. They do it once you're in, but it's just a bunch, it's a BS thing so that they can come up with stuff that, that you wrong. have attention on that you need more auditing or, or training with, okay. right? But the stress test is most of us have some stress. And so they're like, how would you, you know, we can show you how to, you know, not be stressed out. And again, you know, it's a BS thing just to sucker people in. That's all it is. That's all it is. And people, if I had a dollar for every time someone said to me, well, Tori, I don't know what Scientology is. And I say to him over and over, neither does anyone. That was designed by Hubbard. He said, make it a mystery sandwich so that the, the real stuff is inside and they have to go inside to get it. And now once they're inside, you get surrounded, you've got the peer pressure, you've got all the you know mind control stuff and it's very difficult to get away from it. All right. Well, on that note, we are out of time. Okay. And I want to tell you guys, if you want to know more, that you should go to Tori's show. It's Magoo. Tori Magoo, 40, it's T-O-R-Y Magoo 44 on YouTube. Yes. And I mean, and, and she covers so many different topics and in an intelligent and really interesting way. If you have more questions, post them on the Facebook. I'll get Tori to take a look and she'll uh, give us some more answers. If I didn't get to your question, I wanted to thank Suzanne Devlin for sending in a question and also James and everybody else. Um, it was great. Very appreciated. Keep going when I send out a request. I really want to hear from you guys. And thank you so much for joining us. We had a little extra long media mayhem today because we had a really special guest. Thanks so much, Tori. Thank you for having me. I'll see you guys next time on the next media mayhem. Bye-bye.